So good afternoon from my side. I'm Christoph Kams from the ECB's uh, Monetary Policy Department. So welcome to this afternoon session of our conference, which is also the last session before we're going to wrap up. I'm very happy to, to chair the session uh, in a conference that so far I've enjoyed very much. And so the last session of today is on banking and safe assets. We're going to have two papers. The first one will be pre presented by Shohini Kundu, who is an assistant professor at uh, UCLA. He will speak about the aggregate effects of deposit shocks. And then we are happy to have Salim Bahai um, from the University College of London as a discussant. And as in previous sessions, we're going to have 25 minutes for the presentation, then 10 to 15 minutes for the discussant, and then uh, um, some minutes also for questions from the floor here in Frankfurt, but also from the online audience. So if you are connected online, please feel free to uh, raise your questions via the chat function. And so without further ado, I would give the floor to uh, Shohini for the presentation. Okay, great. So first, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work today. Uh, the title of this paper is The Geography of Bank Deposits and the Origins of Aggregate Fluctuations. This is joint work with Songjin Park and Nishant Vats, who are two excellent PhD candidates from the University of Chicago, and both of them are on the market this year, so please keep an eye out for them. So in the, in the, motivation, the motivation for this paper comes from a simplified diagram of a bank's balance sheet. In this simplified diagram, a bank's assets consist of various types of loans, securities, and other assets. And these long-term and liquid assets are financed primarily by liquid liabilities in the form of demand deposits. Now, this liquidity transformation is critical for financing long-term and liquid assets but it's also a key source of vulnerability for banks in the economy. In this paper, we introduce a new source of financial fragility, which is the geography of bank deposits. We posit that the geography of banking assets and liabilities can make the economy on aggregate more susceptible to idiosyncratic shocks. So what do I mean by this? Well, banks collect deposits across geographies and then allocate it towards lending activities. So concretely, loans in Los Angeles might be financed using deposits from Washington, D.C. And so local shocks that affect Washington, D.C. can transmit to distant areas. This problem is aggravated if bank deposits exhibit geographic concentration. And that's what we empirically test in this paper. We show that local exogenous shocks to areas where bank deposits are geographically concentrated can account for aggregate fluctuations. And that's what we refer to as the deposits channel of aggregate fluctuations. So the research objective is, can local deposit shocks account for aggregate fluctuations? The classical economics answer is no, idiosyncratic shocks cannot account for aggregate fluctuations as implied by the central limit theorem. But two re recently developed lines of inquiry in macroeconomics challenge this view. The first is the granular hypothesis of Gebex, in which he argues that when economic activity is fat-tailed in their finite samples, the central limit theorem breaks down. And the second hypothesis comes from Asimoglu, Carvalho, Ozdoglar, and Tabastalehi, in which they argue that idiosyncratic shocks are amplified in the presence of a network structure. This paper combines both of these hypotheses. First, we show that bank deposits are geographically concentrated, exhibiting fat tails. And second, bank internal capital markets provide a mechanism for the amplification of idiosyncratic shocks through their network structure. So the overarching objective of this paper is to study the mechanism through which the geography of bank deposits and idiosyncratic shocks can account for aggregate fluctuations. There are four key findings in this paper. First, we introduce a new fact, which is that bank deposits are geographically concentrated. Specifically, we find that 30% of bank deposits come from a single county. Second, we construct novel bank-specific deposit shocks by combining the geographic concentration of deposits with 
local natural disaster-induced property damages. Third, we show that these idiosyncratic deposit shocks can account for aggregate fluctuations. And the transmission of local deposit shocks into aggregate fluctuations occurs through the deposits channel. So specifically, local disaster shocks negatively affect bank deposits, which then negatively affect bank lending in other areas. And lastly, we argue that financial frictions are critical for the aggregation of idiosyncratic shocks. These frictions include bank capital and regulatory constraints, banks' informational advantages, and the stickiness in bank borrower relationships. So first is the fact, which is that bank deposits are geographically concentrated. Note that this is the within bank concentration of deposits and not the within county concentration of deposits. So using summary of deposits data from the FDIC, we identify the share of deposits coming from each county for each bank. Let me be specific on how we construct this figure. We take a bank like PNC Bank and we look at where PNC raises the greatest amount of deposits from. And we rank those counties based on the share of deposits coming from those particular counties. So county number one refers to the county in which PNC raises the greatest amount of deposits. County number two is the county in which PNC raises the second greatest amount of deposits and so on and so forth. So the x-axis denotes the county number and the y-axis denotes the share of deposits. And here we have uh, plotted three different lines. So the blue line shows the simple average of the share of deposits uh, across all banks for each county number. The red line presents a weighted average which weights the share of deposits coming uh, across all banks for each county based on the bank's total assets. And the green line plots the regression margins after taking out a county cross year and bank cross year fixed effect. And we can see that regardless of the methodology, the largest deposit county accounts for almost 30% of bank deposits. Now, you might be concerned that perhaps the geographic concentration of deposits is a fairly new phenomenon, or perhaps it's driven by the smallest of banks or the largest of banks. So we do a battery of robustness tests in which we verify that the geographic concentration of deposits is not a new phenomenon. In fact, we can see it from 1994 when our sample uh, period begins. The deposit concentration is neither driven by the smallest of banks, nor is it driven by the largest of banks. The share of deposits coming from the largest deposit county doesn't vary with the percentile of bank deposits, bank assets, bank liabilities, or bank loans. And the largest deposit county is scattered across the United States. So it's not the case that the largest deposit county is all coming from New York City, for example. So next, we switch gears and try and understand how natural disasters affect aggregate deposit growth. We show that local natural disasters negatively affect bank deposits, both in the short run and in the long run. And we identify county level shocks using local natural disaster induced property damages. So this figure presents a heat map of the property damage per capita across counties from 1994 through 2018. And you can see that some areas in the United States are very prone to natural disasters uh, relative to other areas, such as Texas, Florida, the Gulf region. And some areas experience relatively uh, less property damage per capita over the sample period. And these natural disasters represent a wide range of hazard types, everything from winter, uh, winter weather and severe storms to hurricanes and tornadoes. Some of these events occur very frequently, such as wind and severe storms, but they don't incur nearly as high damages uh, in terms of the total uh, cost relative to events that occur less frequently, such as hurricanes um, and uh, wildfires. So next, what we analyze is the relationship between deposit growth in a particular county and the disaster shock in that county in the previous year. And in our most conservative specification, we include county fixed effects to control for the time invariant heterogeneity across counties and state cross year fixed effects to account for state level trends. And we find that a one standard deviation disaster shock is associated with a 0 0.07 to 0.11 percentage points decline in deposit growth. This is comparable with the 25th percentile of deposit growth. 
So we find that a one standard deviation disaster shock corresponds to a loss of $570 per capita. And so this result tells us that there's an immediate effect on deposits following a disaster shock. Now, naturally, the next question that arises is, is this effect transient or is it persistent? So to answer this question, we study the Jordan projection in which we analyze the long run response of deposit growth to disaster shocks. We find that there's an immediate decline following a disaster shock in deposit growth, and this effect persists even 10 years after the initial shock. And so the takeaway from this analysis is twofold. First, we find that local disaster shocks negatively affect local bank deposits, and second, that this effect is permanent. So next, we look at how disasters affect aggregate deposit growth by, uh, by constructing uh, bank-specific um, deposit shocks weighting the county-level shock by a, share, a bank's share of deposits in a particular county. And so here, uh, we have constructed this bank-level shock by weighting county-level damages uh, per capita based on the sh bank's share of deposits. And after constructing the shock, we establish two key properties of the shock. First, that the shocks are idiosyncratic, and second, that the shocks are important. So for the shocks to be idiosyncratic, they shouldn't be foreseen or anticipated. And so first, we regressed our bank level shock on a multitude of bank specific variables. This includes total assets, loans, equity, cash, deposits, hedging assets, dividends, and income. And we find that there isn't any robust uh, pattern between these bank characteristics and the bank level shock. Second, from the univariate regressions, we find that the explanatory power is close to zero, suggesting that these bank characteristics can't predict bank level shocks in any robust statistical or quantitative sense. So even if you don't buy that, we then analyze whether these shocks are idiosyncratic in two different dimensions. The figure to the left plots the kernel density of the AR1 coefficient associated with these bank level shocks. And the figure to the right presents the uh, kernel density of the pairwise R square for these bank level shocks. And both of these figures indicate that the AR1 coefficient is centered around zero as well as the pairwise R square. This suggests that these shocks lack spatial and temporal dynamics and they exhibit low persistence and low cross-bank correlation, which are two properties that you might think are associated with idiosyncratic shocks. However, despite being idiosyncratic, these shocks are important in the sense that they can predict aggregate declines in deposits and liquidity creation. So in these two figures, we present the long-run bank response in deposits and liquidity creation to the deposit shocks. We find that there is an immediate impact uh, once a bank experiences a negative deposit shock, and these effects diminish uh, five years after the initial shock occurs. So in terms of magnitudes, we find that a one standard deviation increase in the deposit shock is associated with 0.97 percentage points decline in deposit growth and 0.19 percentage points decline in liquidity creation. So next, we extract aggregate and granular shocks from these bank-specific shocks using the GIV methodology of Gebex and Koyen. So we take our bank-level shocks and we weight it by a bank's share of lending activity in the economy to construct these aggregate shocks. And then we construct granular shocks by subtracting equal weighted shocks from the aggregate shocks. And the reason why we subtract equal weighted shocks is to remove the effect of all common factors. So intuitively, this granular shock captures the idiosyncratic deposit growth experienced by large banks following natural disasters. Now, this figure presents a time series plot of our aggregate deposit shock. And we conduct a narrative analysis to ensure that these shocks don't just reflect noise, but rather they reflect fundamental changes in the microeconomy of different regions. And you can see that our aggregate shocks coincide with major natural disasters, the largest of which is Hurricane Katrina, uh, but there are also major floods and wildfires that also occur throughout this time period. We then conduct a narrative analysis of the crest, and you can see based on this table that oftentimes these natural disasters affect uh, multiple states, and oftentimes there are multiple natural disasters that occur in a given uh, year. 
And then last week, we show that these aggregate shocks are nicely correlated with the insurance payout, suggesting that if uh, that the aggregate shocks reflect the magnitude of the disaster that occurs in that year. So next is our headline figure in which we document that the granular deposit shocks can account for aggregate fluctuations. And specifically, we posit that there's a negative relationship between bank deposit shocks and GDP growth. So in the next set of slides, uh, we'll codify this relationship more rigorously through regression frameworks and establish that the deposits channel can explain a substantial amount of aggregate fluctuations. So first, we regress GDP growth at time t on the granular shock at time t minus 1. And we find that a one standard deviation granular shock reduces economic growth by 0 0.05 to 0 0.07 percentage points. This estimate is statistically significant at the 1% level and is robust uh, across all columns. Naturally, the next question that arises is, well, how much variation in GDP growth can be explained by these granular shocks? So to answer this question, we regress GDP growth at time t on lags of our granular shock. And we find that collectively, the granular shocks can explain 3.3% of variation in economic growth, as indicated by the R-square. Now, to understand whether 3.3% is a large number or whether it's a small number, we study how our shock compares to other shocks that are commonly used in the macroeconomics literature. And we do this by conducting a kitchen sink analysis in which we run a horse race between our shock, excuse me, and other shocks that are used in the macroeconomics literature. This includes oil shocks, monetary policy surprises, uncertainty shocks, term spreads, uh, government expenditure shocks, and Gebex's granular residual. And there are two key takeaways from this analysis. First is that our granular shock can explain as much variation as other macroeconomic shocks. And in some instances, it can explain more variation than other macroeconomic shocks. And second, that the effect of the granular shock is robust to controlling for other macroeconomic shocks, as you can see by the point estimate. Uh, across the first row. Now, a concern with our analysis is that, yes, perhaps the granular shock can explain as much variation as other macroeconomic shocks, but it may capture the direct effect of disasters on economic growth rather than the effect of idiosyncratic shocks to deposit growth. So to address this concern, we examine the long-run response of GDP growth on aggregate disaster shocks, which is measured using total property damages per capita. And we compare this to the response of GDP growth to our idiosyncratic shocks. Now we find that there's no statistically or economically relevant direct effect of the disaster shock on economic growth, which lends credence to our main finding that the results are driven by idiosyncratic shocks to deposit growth. And now using this setup, we're then able to estimate the deposit elasticity of economic growth. And we do this using a 2SLS specification. Now, this is the main contribution of the paper. This paper addresses an unanswered question in the macro finance literature, which is, what are the aggregate effects of deposit shocks? Identifying the effects of disruptions in bank deposits on economic growth is a major empirical challenge, and that's because so far the extant literature has relied on cross-sectional estimates. The issue with using cross-sectional estimates is that aggregate variables that don't exhibit cross-sectional variation can still affect aggregate elasticity. So by estimating the beta coefficient in cross-sectional regressions, a partial equilibrium effect is being picked up on, but not a general equilibrium effect because the intercept has not been identified. This identification strategy allows us to identify the missing intercept and directly estimate the aggregate effects of deposit shocks. So in column two, we first regress deposit growth on the granular residual and then use this instrument, this estimated value to then estimate the deposit elasticity of economic growth. We find that the deposit elasticity of economic growth is 0.87, suggesting that a 1% uh, de decline in deposit growth is associated with 
uh, decline in economic growth by 0.87 percentage points. Now, this estimate may seem substantial, so we then estimate the loan supply elasticity of economic growth for which there are estimates in the extant literature. And we find that the loan supply elasticity of economic growth is 0.14, which falls within the range of past work that I have with Nishant as well as Terreno 2020, suggesting that this estimate of 0.87 is well calibrated. Now further, we can use this setup to estimate the money multiplier. And what we find is that a $1 increase in deposits increases lending by $1.18. So far, we have shown that deposit shocks can affect aggregate economic growth. But the question is, how do local deposit shocks affect economic growth? We argue that the key mechanism through which shocks to banks affect economic growth is lending activity. And we established this by using microdata on small business lending and mortgage lending. So here in our estimation, we study what the relationship is between lending growth conducted by a particular bank in a particular county in a particular year on the deposit shock that's experienced by that bank. Our identifying assumption here is that banks face identical investment opportunities within a county. A weaker version of this identifying assumption is that any friction which creates a wedge between available investment opportunities across banks within a county is unrelated to an idiosyncratic shock that happens elsewhere. And in addition, we control for the time invariant importance of a bank within a county by including county cross bank fixed effects. And so in studying the relationship between lending growth and the bank level deposit shocks, even after including high dimensional fixed effects, we find that a one standard deviation deposit shock is associated with a decline of 1.09 to 1.85 percentage points in lending growth. Now, you might be concerned that perhaps this is driven entirely by the affected counties that experience natural disasters. So to address this concern, we disaggregate the lending conducted in unaffected counties and affected counties. And we find that the estimate is significantly higher in terms of magnitude for unaffected counties relative to affected counties, which is consistent with the literature that's documented that affected counties experience an increase in credit demand following natural disasters. We further verify these results using data on uh, mortgages. So here, uh, we study the relation between deposit shocks and mortgage lending. And we're able to disaggregate based on the type of mortgage. So in column one, we have new home purchases. In column two, we have refinancing loans. In column three, we have home improvement loans. And we find that the pecking order of the effects on different mortgage types is consistent with the argument that uh, contracting frictions are more pronounced for new home purchases because borrowers don't have an established payment history unlike with home refinancing and home improvement loans. And so the contraction in lending is dominant in loan types where banks face more contracting friction. We also find that the effect is dominant for loans that are more likely to be funded by deposits, which further lends credence to the deposits channel of aggregate fluctuations. We establish this by comparing jumbo to non-jumbo mortgages. So a unique feature of the mortgage market is securitization in which uh, oftentimes deposits are replaced with bonds as a source of funding. And this is a result of the secondary market activities of the government sponsored enterprises. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac cannot purchase jumbo mortgages. So these are more likely to be driven by deposit funding. So in this regression specification, we compare jumbo originations to non-jumbo originations conducted by the same bank in the same county in the same year. And we also include county cross bank cross jumbo fixed effects, which also allows us to relax our uh, weak identifying assumption. And consistent with this, we find that indeed uh, the contraction in lending is pronounced for loans that are more likely to be funded by deposits, which are jumbo mortgages. Uh, let me move this. Okay. And then lastly, uh, we highlight the importance of financial frictions in the aggregation of idiosyncratic shocks. I won't go through these results in the interest of time, but we find that the lending cut is driven by constrained banks, which cut lending more sharply in other areas when they experience local deposit shocks. We also find that banks cut lending in areas where they lack information advantages and they're less likely to extract rents in those areas. 
And we highlight that firms which are more dependent on banks as a source of external financing drive the response in lending growth. And borrower financial constraints and relationship frictions can exacerbate both the cut in lending as well as the real effects that are realized. We conduct a number of robustness checks uh, demonstrating that large banks are responsible for the transmission of idiosyncratic shocks, <clears throat> that the geographic uh, concentration of deposits matters, it's not driven by a sh shocks to collateral value, or granularity in GDP employment, uh, GDP employment and population. So before I conclude, and while I conclude, let me just highlight the three key ingredients for this story. For our results to go through, there are three important factors that can explain how idiosyncratic shocks can account for aggregate fluctuations. The first is that bank deposits uh, should exhibit geographic concentration. The second is that the banks have to be large to transmit these shocks through internal capital markets. And third is that the natural disaster has to be sizable. If deposits were perfectly diversified, then even the largest natural disaster would end up being a drop in the bucket when it comes to affecting uh, funding for the bank. If the bank is a small bank and it experiences a large natural disaster, it won't be able tra to transmit these shocks through internal capital markets and if there's a little bit of rain, even for the largest bank in the most concentrated market, it's unlikely to wipe out deposit funding. So to conclude, uh, this paper documents a new source of bank fragility, which is the geography of bank deposits. We find that bank deposits are geographically concentrated, and we highlight the role of internal capital markets in propagating idiosyncratic shocks. Specifically, we find that idiosyncratic shocks can account for 3.3% of variation in economic growth. And the mechanism through which uh, this occurs is that natural disasters negatively affect deposits, which then negatively affects bank lending. And lastly, we highlight the role of financial frictions in magnifying the deposits channel. These frictions include bank capital constraints, informational advantages, and the stickiness in bank borrower relationships. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to, the, uh, to Salim's discussion. Thank you very much, Shohini, for this very clear and very interesting presentation. And let me then uh, hand over to uh, Salim for his discussion. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, perfect. So thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, uh, for inviting me to discuss this paper. I, I really enjoyed uh, reading it, and it's a real pleasure to, to get to uh, this paper to discuss. Um, so, you know, I don't need to motivate this question, I don't think, at all to this, to this audience. Um, they're looking at uh, the aggregate effects of, of shocks to, uh, to bank credit supply, and the paper is, is very well done. There's a neat identification strategy. There's you know, incredibly thorough empirics, as you saw from, from the presentation. Uh, the question is important. And you know, I've seen Johanny Clintus before. I, I knew she would do a, a fantastic job in summarizing the paper. So I'm not going to try and compete with her in doing so. Instead, I want to basically just take it as as uh, as as read and just focus discussion on, on, on some comments and reactions that I had. So I want I want to do basically uh, three things uh, in this discussion. Uh, first is just press a little bit harder on. Uh, identification um, and you know this, this fundamentally is a paper identifying an aggregate shock which is, is very difficult right it's very challenging and so as sort of like as an intellectual exercise uh, I, I wrote down a little model to see whether I could actually get a situation where uh, the granular IV they used is correlated with output absent any banking frictions it's possible and we can quibble about how relevant those mechanisms are uh, but the main the main point of that is to, I wanted to press the authors a little bit harder about what variation they're using and um, how, whether, what's generating their results, essentially. I'll explain that in, in, in the second discussion. Um, then I want to talk about the mechanism, and in particular, the role of the wholesale market in smoothing these shocks and the allocation of deposits, which is not something that's really discussed uh, in the paper. I think it's an important feature of, of, of how these pop shocks could propagate. And lastly, I basically have a question about, about non-local deposits, and it wasn't clear to me from, from reading the paper how exactly you think you've, you've dealt with that. And so I wanted to raise that and, and put that as a final point. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into this little more that I wrote down uh, as a starting point. It's super simple, I can explain it in about, in about five minutes. 
um, and then it will allow me just to think about identification a little bit more. So I'm going to have a situation where there's, there's uh, n counties you know, in the US uh, and time indexed by T as a single tradable consumption good, as a representative household uh, in each uh, county and a bank in each county too. Okay, so this is our, our bank elevator Asian. The households are going to maximize uh, lifetime utility from consumption and they're going to consume an endowment and income uh, from deposits uh, with an endogenous interest rate here, uh, RT, uh, and their savings would be endogenous to DT. And then you know, they'll have some period budget constraint I've written down here. And then there'll be some disasters. And I'm going to assume that these disasters are going to damage uh, the endowment. So one thing, thing I'm, I'm imposing here is that disaster does affect output. Uh, there was a supply, surprising result to me when I read the paper that actually, if you just look at aggregate disaster shocks in the US, they don't. I'm going to make the assumption, assumption that they do. Uh, you know, we can quibble about that as well. So in period one, this, this county could receive a disaster of probability pi, which lowers its endowment to a level which is lower than y bar, the average um, level of income um, that, can, uh, that it would receive. Uh, in period, from period two onwards, uh, it will always receive uh, Y bar as its endowment, and there'll be some heterogeneity in the initial level of, of income. So there'll be some wealth heterogeneity going on as well, which will determine uh, the initial size of, of savings and in turn the bank's balance sheets. So banks in this model, which is this is what it's really trying to uh, include, uh, are basically pure, essentially frictionless price taking intermediaries. The only thing I'm going to do is just force them to raise deposits from households in the same county when they're located. Okay, so they raise deposits always from one place. So we just we just inbuilt the uh, the geographical concentration that Shahoni uh, mentioned, but they're going to raise as much as they as they want at the perennial interest rate, and they're going to lend to a national representative firm. Okay, so there's no lending frictions here at all, and there'll be some aggregate lending technology which just takes the sum of all the deposits um, raised by all banks. And, and generate some aggregate uh, return from doing that. In t equals one, f will be concave, and then from t greater than two onwards, uh, we're going to have a linear technology that we just jump directly to a steady state. So everyone's savings in, in period one will just persist into the infinite future. Okay, and then GDP is just simply the aggregate output from from all lending plus the endowment, and then equilibrium will just be a set of household order equations which pins down the amount of, of uh, savings a household have, uh, providing interest rates and the marginal return on, on lending, okay, which is a national variable, and then RT will, will clear the market. And then the key point here is that banks are available in this model. I could just have easily had every single household uh, invest in physical capital and their investment would fluctuate as, um, as uh, they hit, get hit by these disasters, okay? And I'm going to simulate this model, so n will be equal to 100, I have 100 counties, and 5% and, um, uh, of possible probability. This actually, I'm not going to do any quantitative results, these numbers are relevant, but the point I want to, to make here is that the uncertainty is basically just coming from, from sampling, right? So in some periods, five counties may get hit by a disaster, in other periods, four may get hit by disaster or whatever. So all the variation and output in this model is just driven by uh, the failure of the law of large numbers, which is a, a key part of Shahoni's talk, in the frequency of, of national disasters. Okay, so in, in some sample, some simulations there'll be a lot of national disasters, in others there'll be few. Okay, so then we can just do exactly the same exercise as, as uh, Shahoni uh, did. I can construct my granular instrument that simply uh, the disaster, the, the, the uh, indicator of whether a, a, um, a region hits a disaster or not. Uh, and I can weight it by the size of the bank's balance sheet in, in that region, which is just its share of deposits over the national share, minus this, this equal weighting thing, which is what the granular IV uh, relies upon. And I can compute the correlation between this IV and an output. Okay. And, and actually, the way this, the, what Shahani is really pushing for is that. You know, if, if everyone's the same um, and uh, we're all extent identical, there's no granularity. This 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 uh, instrument goes to zero, even though it may have some natural disasters. There's no the zero credit, credit shorts is net out, and the correlation between between the instrument and output is equal to zero. And this fits the paper. 
And you also get the result that disasters have a permanent impact on deposits and bank lending, but that's simply through uh, households being permanent income consumers. Okay. Um, now, let me just tweak this in, the, in a couple of very small ways. So the first thing I want to do is add wealth heterogeneity. Uh, so I'm going to make households have uh, different ex ante levels of wealth. So period zero endowments will be different. So some will have a high endowment, others will have a low endowment. And I'm going to make preferences on the bottom of So that's the idea that uh, when you're relatively wealthy, you have a lower margin of density to consume. Okay, that's why I'm sort of just forcing into the model here. And then when you do that and you simulate this model, the correlation between uh, the granular IV and, and output uh, in period two becomes uh, positive. And that would sort of push up the estimates that um, uh, Shahani presented. So that would mean that essentially these deposit shocks are positively correlated with output, right? So it's, it's the inverse of, of the results we found in the data. So it's just, it's just making, making the results seem weaker. And the intuition of this is, is really straightforward. Banks from wealthy regions uh, lend more. Uh, wealthy households have lower marginals to consume. So when they get hit by a disaster, their deposits fluctuate by less. And so disasters disproportionately hit these wealthy regions also hit larger banks. And therefore, the impact on aggregate savings is, is smaller. Okay. Uh, and that basically stabilizes output. Okay. Compared to a, a sort of just a, a shock that hits. Uh, poor regions. And you actually can reverse that by changing preferences around. It's just it's purely a function of these uh, preferences I assumed. Okay. The second thing you could, I, I tried doing was looking at heterogeneity and how, how hard the disasters hit. Okay. And, and what I had in mind when I did this was the idea that, you know, a dollar of property damage um, does different things depending on uh, where the disaster happens. So imagine a dollar of property damage in New York may do more um, than a dollar of property damage, it's more to GDP or more to the endowment of the people affected uh, than a dollar of property damage in, in a rural area, for instance. Okay, and maybe that assumption is, is incorrect, but that's what I was sort of going for. If you if you have this, uh, this setup, okay, uh, then you actually just get the exact correlation that uh, Shahani put, which is that there's a, a grand, there's a correlation between the granular IV and alpha, which is negative. Okay, and the idea here is simply proportionally saving. If you live in one of these regions where a disaster has a bigger impact, because also the given size has a bigger impact on your on your, on your income, uh, you want to save more, and that means you have bigger banks and losses for disasters. Okay, so I, I mean, these are just different things that fill out the model. Um, there's a bigger picture uh, uh, that I wanted to, to get from this intellectual exercise, really, which is that you know, the key empirical result in this paper is that disasters hit harder when they occur in regions where big banks raise their deposits. Right? That's how the, the weighting is, uh, is, uh, is constructed. So they hit harder since the output impact is bigger, uh, there's a bigger impact on, on lending as well, okay? And, you know, I, I fully take the point that the regions where banks as a whole raise their deposits from, these sort of concentrated regions for all banks seems to be relatively well distributed across, across the US. But there was less evidence in the paper I could see about how, where the big banks are getting uh, their deposits from. I was trying to find that. And I think you, you need to do more to convince the reader, or you could do more to convince the reader that there is nothing special about the regions where the larger banks are getting their deposits from uh, that would explain your, your results. So just, that's, you know, just give me some, some basic summary statistics. What are their characteristics? Do they differ on their income levels, which is sort of point to this sort of wealth heterogeneity point? Are they more dense? Are they local distribution hubs? Are they regional financial centers? Etc. All these things could, could generate a situation where, uh, you know, I'm thinking more a disaster in New York where large US banks concentrate their deposits does have a bigger impact than a disaster in a county where maybe smaller banks are, are raising their deposits. Okay, so I think, I think it's more than just where the deposits are coming from, it's where the big banks have the deposits from. Uh, and maybe I missed it, but I really cannot find that in the paper. The second, uh, and you know, and, and just, just for full disclosure, the paper does control for for um, for population weighting and GDP weighting and employment weighting. But my point is more there could be other mechanisms that work. So that's sort of my my pressing on on identification. Um, then in terms of of the mechanism, so you know, taking taking the results wholly at face value, what they're, what they're showing is that 
there is a permanent reallocation amongst banks uh, in deposits when one of these idiosyncratic disasters uh, hit. And then when it hits a region where um, uh, you know, big banks are concentrated, that would lead to an even bigger reallocation of deposits, presumably. That, that was sort of my, my reading of the paper. Precisely because, you know, you can imagine a situation where there's a disaster, people start making payments, they import resources from outside their county, and that reshuffles deposits around, around the US. And you know, one implication of this, since loans are illiquid, is that this reallocation will require clearing in the wholesale market. And this market is imperfect. We can't know this for a long, a long, long time. You know, this whole conference is about imperfections in the money market. And so I was wondering, you know, if you have this persistent and efficient allocation of deposits, figure out the aggregate supply, but just the fact that suddenly, because we have these disasters, deposits are now in the wrong place compared to where loans are amongst banks rather than amongst geographies. Um, doesn't that raise potentially the cost of intermediation uh, for the banking system as a whole? Because suddenly they have to reshuffle money around uh, themselves to support the distribution of lending, and you know higher costs of intermediation would in turn reduce uh, credit supply. So it's not about the aggregate supply of deposits per se; it's about how they get allocated as a result uh, of, of the of the shock. And so you know, one simple test of this is simply: is your is the GIV? correlated measures of, of stress in the internet market, for instance, or perhaps in money markets. And the last thing, which is part, partly um, a question, is you know, the key facts in the paper, and this is, this is you know, one of the, the sources of variation that uh, Shahani said their results rely upon, is that 20 to 30 percent of, of uh, banks, um, banks in the US raise 20 to 30 percent of their deposits from a single county. Okay, and this is this is really the source of benefit the variation for the for the IV and sort of implicit in, in this as I understand it is an assumption that the deposits that are supplied in this county are related or react to disasters in the county, right? So they, they, they are somehow from from local agents, right? That's kind of like the, the idea behind this. Um, and so you know the, the question I have was well where does this concentration come from and you're seeing the big national banks do this so it can't just be regional specialization um, there's some discussion in the paper about, about online deposits and shuffling of, of headquarters around which i think is very welcome uh, but the concern i have is that basically banks book all their non-retail deposits through one or two branches okay uh, so and that may not be the hq could be just you know a branch they have in New York or another sort of financial sector. Um, so are the non-retail deposits covered by the statement of deposits data? I, I presumed yes. I couldn't get the firm answer on this when I went there for FDIC. If I look at the flow of funds, around 25% of US deposits. Are you, excuse me, just one second. Are we out of time? Within the next minute. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna finish these bullet points, it's fine. Uh, so about 25% are from the non-bank financial sector with MFs, corporates, rest of the world, the federal government, we you expect these deposits to sort of sit in one particular branch. And there's also, you know, interbank lending and correspondent bank activity that will also take place in, in so that's one or two branches. And so, you know, I was wondering basically, are these concentrated deposits really local? And, you know, as a test at the bank level, is there a different sensitivity between deposits and the disasters depending on concentration? Uh, so that's what I wanted to say. It was a super interesting paper, uh, and I won't do is sort of pushing you to think a little bit more about your results, but it, it's a very impressive piece of work. I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss it. Thank you very much, Salim. We now have uh, some time for a couple of questions, either from here at Frankfurt or from the online audience. And, and of course, also I would like to give Shohini um, some time to react to your great discussion. Maybe while waiting for questions, if Shohini would already like to. Sure. So thank you, Salim, for the very insightful discussion. I think it gives us a lot to think about in the next iteration of this paper. Um, let me just touch on two quick points. So I think so far the paper is kind of agnostic to what actually happens to deposits following a disaster shock. We haven't explored whether the deposits exit the banking system or whether there's reallocation towards other banks and other regions, which from a policy perspective, uh, has different implications in the sense that if you think that the 
uh, deposits are leaving the banking system entirely, you might think that perhaps there's a failure of the discount window or the central bank in stepping in providing funds in the short run. If you think that perhaps there's reallocation in intrabank markets, perhaps it's the second channel you alluded to on intrabank stress. And I think the intrabank stress channel is, is very interesting and something that we should look uh, more into, but it's just something that um, so far we've been agnostic to as to what happens after a uh, disaster hits. The last point about the geographic concentration of deposits. This point is well taken, and I think it's something we've struggled with in this project, which is that we're in part limited by the data that's available to us. The summary of deposits data uh, has some guidelines on how they book deposits in different regions, but we can't entirely rule out whether deposits that are booked in one region may actually be attributed to another region. In the worst case, it's possible that it could understate our results if we end up attributing natural disasters in areas where deposits um, don't necessarily experience an outflow or where the disaster didn't occur. But that's, that's an accounting um, concern that we've, we've tried to do a number of tests to get at measurement concerns, you know, the headquarters switching, how that leads to reallocation of deposits. But we're largely limited by the granularity of the summary of deposits data. And, I think it's, 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 a, it's an open question. Why is there geographic concentration of deposits? How does this vary um, depending on the type of concentration? And it, it's, it's something we're looking into. Thank you very much, Rohini. So I'm, I'm looking around here um, in the uh, physical audience. Is there any, any question you would like to raise at this moment? That's not the case. Then let me thank Shahini and also Salim for, for two excellent presentations and discussions.